Well, thank you very much and thanks for having me and thanks to all the people I can't see for listening. The I'll say just a little bit, but now I can see some of you. I, I, just a little bit about the this <clears throat> for 11 years from 1990 to 2001, I directed a program called Implementing Policy Change that advised ministers of government around implementing large scale policy change. And over that that period of we were in about 40 countries or perhaps two or th 300 policies that we were helping people on the change management of. And the reason the rationale behind that was the recognition, not unlike the conversation in scaling, that a lot of things appeared on paper, usually as written approved policies or legislation, didn't translate themselves all the way through into performance the way people had hoped and expected. At the end of that period, MacArthur Foundation asked me, asked us if we could flip that experience inside out and instead of looking at change from the top down, look at it from the innovation up, but with the same question in mind, namely how does large system change happen? So for the last six years, I've been preoccupied with this issue or if you count the 11 years before that, you could say for the last 27 years, so it's an issue I think is important, and I guess I'm a slow learner, but I do feel like I've got a sense now as to the dynamics of what's going on in this kind of change process and a healthy respect for the complexity of it. So I'm going to say just a little bit by way of definition, then I'm going to try and take you through the logic of, of scaling uh, and try to end with some reflections on what it means for people in research enterprises like yours. So I'll begin with it with the definition, if I might. The definition that we use came from my colleague and friend Johannes Lind and Arna Hartman, and it reads like this: Scaling is the process. L Lottie, are you are you sharing your? Are no, you I'm, I'm going to share your screen. Fine, I'll go. <laughs> I just wanted to check that we weren't missing something. Okay, so this sorry, is the sorry, last thing sorry. before the slides. Uh, scaling up is the process of expanding, adapting and sustaining successful policies and practices in geographic space and over time to reach a greater number of people. I think that's pretty close to the intuitive notion of what scaling is, but the important I would have you take away from that is that sometimes these are policies, sometimes they're, they're practices, uh, but the issue includes not getting them to large numbers of people, but getting them in sustainable ways to large numbers of people. And in this case, it means that they stand the test of time, not the test of space. So the, for obvious reasons, that gets you deeply into the incentives, where those incentives lie, and also into the issue of systems. And it's those two links I'm going to try to flesh out for you just a little bit. Now I am going to go to the slides. I'll begin with, with what you might call the true test on this, which is outcomes that match the size of the sustained. And, and I'll, have you a kind of a Rorschach test way of thinking about this. When I've used this same graphic with government officials or sometimes with large corporations, the thing I focus on the white space to the right of the bar. The businesses see that as the market and the gov government see that as the unmet need. When I show this to people in the development business, they usually focus on the little orange bars on the left, which is the progress making. And I, also a legitimate way to think about change. And when one of those little orange bars moves a bit to the right, we're quite proud of ourselves. And again, I think appropriately, but not if you're focusing on what I would call the denominator, which is the problem. And so this approach begins every conversation about any change with an articulation of what's the scale of the need and what's the plan, at least over time or hypothetically, for trying to reach that need. Said. Think about that from the point of view of businesses and governments, it's kind of part of their DNA. Businesses think of that as address the market, governments think of it as relevant population. But if instead you think about it from the point of view of the world that many of us live in, a donor project world that works from three-year plan to three-year plan or five-year plan to five-year plan, or in the worst case, plan to one-year plan, the reward for a project is often and most typically another project. That's the world I know many of you live in. I can tell you it's I lived in for 35 years. And 
That world was constructed with, I'll say this with a little mea culpa, back in the 1960s when we decided that the most efficient way to deliver foreign assistance in most cases, projects, and the most appropriate duration for a project, three, four, or five years, and we conformed everything to that. So if you work backwards, pick your donor of, of preference, work backwards, their strategic plan probably of not much longer duration than that. And they're probably composed largely, or at least largely from projects. And it means that the way, the way we are trained now to think about change is what does the project achieve and how does the project get picked up by a subsequent? The, that's exact contrast to the scaling mentality which looks at the system, what was the system prior to the project, what's the system going to be after the project, and how is the project or the intervention or the research a material alteration of the after as compared to the before. I'll give you a couple more things that compound this complexity. The first bullet says double, double, half, half. In the last decade, the number of official donors has just about doubled. And if you add in the many foundations that are involved, it's a larger multiple than that. As a result, the number of projects has just about doubled. The average size of project has just, the average duration has just about half. So over that period of time, we have more and more, smaller and smaller, shorter and shorter financing bundles chasing the same big problems we've been chasing all along. Uh, it's maybe, it's not a surprise, it was a bit of a disappointing surprise to me when I went through a, quite a large sample of projects that considered themselves successful at the R&D or at the pilot phase that you'd have to stretch to say that 5% of those ever went to scale. 5%, in my opinion, is a generous estimate. So if you look at it that way, that means 19 out of 20, not of the things we we do and claim success, were successful ever reach scale. That's not a good track record. Even venture capitalists go for 10%. So as a minimum, we ought to be able to double our success rate. And I want to suggest at least a couple of guidelines for how people have tried to do that. Third metric that I think adds complexity to this is my own analysis suggests that the typical amount of time for those that do scale successfully to get to scale is about 15 years. Now, there are exceptions to that, and particularly with the information revolution, you sometimes get remarkable exceptions to that. But even there, when you know the full backstory, 15 years is not an unreasonable estimate of how long it takes an innovation to get to scale under good circumstances. So that means the timeline for imagining a pathway to scale, if it's realistic, is probably not much shorter than that. And finally, one to seven or one to 20. This is the, the point I'm trying to illustrate here is that the relevance of foreign in general, and by that I include the kind of money that funds your centers, that money had become a lesser and lesser percentage of money going into these sorts of endeavors. If you look at it as foreign assistance to foreign direct investment, it's now one to seven. If you look at it, foreign assistance to domestic resource mobilization, meaning local taxes in the countries where we work, it's now one to 20. Uh, I'll give you an extreme case of that. It would be Indonesia. In 1977, Indonesia's ODA was official development assistance was 43 and a half percent central government spending. In 2016, it was 0.08 percent. So think of it as going from $1 two and a half dollars to one dollar out of twelve hundred and fifty dollars. The point I'm trying to make is that the things we're doing, while important, are no longer the dominant story. If things scale, and particularly if they're going to be sustained at scale, it's only going to happen if the commercial private sector and or the governments of the countries where we work take these things up and integrate them into their new normal. So if we're taking our kind of research and prototypes and projects and trying to imagine how do they play a meaningful role in the world that I'm describing, I want to suggest that there are four features that really help to think about it. The 
first is to really understand how what we're doing fits into our understanding of what could potentially make the S go vertical. You know, for those of you who've studied diffusion of innovation, a lot of which began with work in the agricultural sector, there's this magic that happens where it goes slow, slow, and then all of a sudden it goes fast, fast, fast. That's the verticality. But there's a bit of a mystery about what actually initiates that verticality. If you read popular books like Tipping Point, what they said was it essentially, it's a contagion factor. There's a critical, and you hit a tipping point, and if the thing that everyone else is doing is what everyone else wants to do. That, I think, is a fair representation of what happens in things like consumer goods and also in some agricultural practices. But for the most part, when I've seen things go vertical, it's because something has changed, not on the demand side, but on the supply side. So something happened in government policy, in pricing, in availability, that made a material change in people's willingness and ability to use that. That's often because the buyer and the, the, the payer and the user are not one and the same person, or at least the role of subsidies plays an important role in the process. So the first thing, if we're using projects, is to say, what could, what's the constraint that could potentially, if unlocked, allow this verticality to happen? And is we can do in a short term, three to five year intervention, that would materially affect that constraint. Maybe it's a knowledge constraint, maybe it's a systemic constraint, maybe it's a subsidy constraint. The second related is to say, what's the link between, in your case, the research, a, it's a more general, a short term intervention, and systems change? So there's the project, the prototype, the methodology, the innovation over on the left-hand side. As I said, all too typically, what happens is that those things become gateways to other interventions and research. If they're going to move to sustainable change, they need to do something for the systems that are applied by governments and markets. And in a very light type philanthropy, what does it mean to affect the system? If I were simplifying that, I'd say, it's either trying to change policy and incentives or capacity. So is there something we're doing reasonable prospect for changing either of those things? And if so, what beyond our research is going to be necessary in order to make those changes real? Excuse me. Here's the third point. The point is that in every piece of large system change that I've studied, there's an element that I think gets less attention we have a, a gear on the left-hand side that I'm calling innovation. That gear, I would submit to you, is actually spinning quite well. And I, I know from your perspectives and others, more, different, and better could help. But really, the innovation system globally is doing quite a remarkable job of generating new ideas and new methodologies. On the right-hand side, the world now has quite an array of delivery systems. As I said, mostly governments and very few places you can go where there are not commodities for sale, and there are very few places you can go where government hasn't penetrated in some way or another. The thing that's missing, and missing in fairly dramatic form, the gateway, the thing that those innovations into the ongoing platforms of delivery. If you think about this for commercial activities, particularly very profitable ones, that intermediation is primarily performed by venture capital, investment banking, things of that sort. But if you're in the pro-poor world, that intermediation is usually an uncompensated function. The innovators can't pay for it and the deliverers can't pay for it. So unless owners or someone else targets that as an area of activity, it tends not to happen and therefore you get innovations go unscaled and going unimproved. When I say intermediation, what do I mean? I mean things like this. I mean things like system strengthening, change management, fundraising, investment packaging, advocacy, convening, the list could go on beyond that. But the, the, everything that it takes to translate successful innovation, by successful I mean effective, proof of concept effective innovation, 
widespread practice. And any of you who've ever been directly involved in policy change or in just making systems reform know that this kind of thing is very difficult, whether you're talking about something in Australia, in the UK, in the United States, in Germany, or in Kenya. Basically, it involves large bureaucratic systems, be they corporate or, or individual, or a large number of small entrepreneurs having to adopt a set of practices and be able to deliver them to large numbers of people. This does not happen easily, whether you're in the education sector, the health sector, or in this case, the agriculture sector. It takes a lot of momentum to make that happen and a lot of work, at least equivalent to the work necessary to generate the innovation in the first place. And finally, the fourth that projects can do is they can really think about how we can use research and, and experimentation to move closer, to basically fill in some of the gap between innovation and And the first thing I would suggest, suggest to you is to think this way, you have to get beyond the design proof of concept rollout paradigm. That would suggest all we need to do is figure it out, test it, prove its efficacy, and then it's simply a question of innovation and rollout. Having now worked with 400 scaling innovations, I can tell you I haven't seen one all that way, not one. What happens with exception is that in the course of rolling things out, you're having to contextualize them and you're having to adapt them to the fact that people don't behave perfectly and that the people who are implementing the people you have greater control over and that the incentive structures are different and that farmers use it partially but not totally. All of that requires a much more adaptive engagement than the design proof of concept rollout paradigm tends to assume. So if you say, well, how do we use projects to get closer on that? I would say there are at least four things. One is you can use the research phase, early phases, not just to develop the thing, but to do everything you can, everything you can to build up the evidence base that a real decision maker, meaning a minister of finance or the head of a company or a would need in order to make that decision. That means envision an audience for information that's not a scientific audience. It's basically a very hands-on audience and not dumbing it down, but trying to figure out how would we present information that would be compelling to them or that would at least answer the questions that they have. Directly related to that is this idea of simplification. And I often say that scaling is a game of subtraction, not a game of addition. Because when we're in pilot phases or experiment phases or research phases, just as Ian said before, if something, the addition of something more would help make something successful, we typically do it. But every one of those things we add for purposes of efficacy complicates things for purposes of scaling. And so the process of scaling is to experiment with could we do less, could we simpler. Could we do it with, could we do it with half implemented and so on? Second thing is, if we're gonna repair this scaling, it's quicker than we normally would to transition to the enge direct engagement of the people who would be doing the delivery at scale, be those commercial seed companies, farmer cooperatives, government agencies, uh, or large corporations. Wait. And, assumption that we'll develop it, and once it's really good and ready, then we'll crosswalk it, engage earlier than you think you might need to with the people who would have to adopt it at the end of the day. Third is focusing every possible ounce of attention you can on it cost. The, a penny or a quarter of a penny can make a big difference on whether things scale or not and also on the implications for current providers if what you're doing has the inadvertent or the secondary effect of displacing some people who are doing things right now, they will work hard to resist the change. And typically, the, the status quo forces are stronger than the forces of change. They're trying to figure some way that this is less threatening to existing providers, actors, is usually an important part of trying to move ahead at scale. 
And finally, obsessing about the weakest link, looking where could this possibly go wrong and what more research or evidence or engagement could we have to deal with that? So think about something like, like drug tolerant maize and ask yourself, if you were thinking about it this way, where are all the steps that could prevent this as effective as the actual seed itself is from reaching the scale that you're hoping and I would suggest to you that most of those are not agronomic. Some of them are, but most of them are not. I'm trying to figure out how far the people who work on drought tolerant maize can and should go, managing that other range of issues. Or in your case, I could have put up a cow on this and said, how far do you go? I'm trying to anticipate and engage some of the issues either as a researcher or as a baton pass between researchers and other people that would really make a difference. I'll give you another example. The frequently talked about bags. It's a huge success now. Lots of countries, lots of obvious data on the benefits. But it sat on the shelf for 20 years as an innovation until somebody figured out how to get local manufacturers in Africa producing these things and doing it in a way that was really cost effective and got them into the hands of the wanted and needed them. So a great technology went unused more or less for two decades. So with the try to address these issues, Julie and I produced this source book. It's got nine chapters. Uh, it's certainly available online. And if some of you want hard copies, I think we can easily make that happen as well. We distributed these at a hard launch at the, the AGRF uh, last week. And one of the, I'm just going to hit from that uh, is that it includes a framework. This happens to be the, the framework I know best and the most associated with for trying to think about how to plan and manage the pathways to scale. It breaks it down into 10 discrete tasks that are in three steps. The, the first step has to do with how you plan with scale in mind. The second step has to do with how you, we call it preconditions, but it basically get the decision by governments and corporations that would be necessary in order to scale things. And the third step has to do with actually managing the scaling process. Another thing the source book lays out is some new tools for assessing scalability. There are a variety of them. The one that I know best is a 32 item checklist that we then elaborated for the USAID's Bureau for Food Security. It looks at a number of factors that directly affect the scalability of different interventions. There are several others. CIMIT has done an interesting one. Uh, four other cited in the in the source book. All of them basically address the same four dimensions: the characteristics of certain interventions that make them more or less scalable. If so, what can you do about it? Are there characteristics of the organizations that do the scaling that make a difference? If so, what can you do about that? Are there in the enabling environment that we know are going to affect it, what are those and how do you do something about those? And finally, contextual factors like the degree homogeneity or heterogeneity and how does that affect the process? Third piece of this uh, source book that I want to bring your attention is it spans it's quite a bit of, of thinking about metrics, monitoring and evaluation. And it says that when we look at innovation, we usually look at what here is called tier one, which is proof of concept, validating the model or the intervention, pilot testing it, impact evaluation, prototype, and so on. But we don't do near a job with tier two and tier three. Tier two is all the stuff necessary for refinement, streamlining, and assessing scalability. It includes things like robustness and what we call second stage pilots. Second stage pilots means if it works under these conditions, will it work under those conditions? If it works at this level of funding, will it work at that level of funding? If it works here, there. And of course, cost efficiency and alternatives. And the change management one, the one that I think is attended to the least, <laughs> looks at what kind of metrics do we need to monitor information and fidelity during scale up? It also looks, by the way, at the relationship between fidelity and adaptation, uh, validation of a scale, continuous improvement, and so on. 
in this sort of our series of discussions about the effects of markets, financing, and enabling. And I won't try to run through all just to let you know that we try to give some examples that we think are good examples where people really did use markets for inclusive scaling. Uh, we also uh, the typical devices for the people these days for creative financing of scaling and some factors in the that make a difference, particularly as they relate to partnership policy, behavioral change, and institutional reform. Two more slides. I want to give you seven uh, conclusions and recommendations that came out of the, the source book. The first is we were asked by the organizers to talk about commercial pathways to scale. But one of the things that we concluded is there is no such thing as a fully commercial pathway to scale. No agricultural innovation that scaled where subsidies and regulation don't make a big difference. So even if government isn't directly providing, the role of government is critical in this and their engagement in, with the whole process, as I know, you know, is a central feature, but we've tended to differentiate uh, in many quarters between the commercial pathway and pathway. And our finding is that the two are very intertwined. The second is that the concept of implementing partners that we have is often too and particularly people and organizations that are involved in things like equipment leasing, input provision, product aggregation. These need to be, they're, they're obviously part of the value chain, but they need to be not just the people who receive whatever it is that we've produced. And you in the source book, several good examples of exactly that. Uh, the third, as I mentioned before, is that the most vexing bottle scaling innovations are usually non-technological, non-agronomic in nature. The fourth, which I haven't mentioned so far, poor farmers' time horizons tend to be extremely short. Uh, for you and me, if we were to make a mistake, it probably costs us a few percentage points on our return. If they make a mistake, it might cost them a child. And so they prioritize minimizing risk over maximizing reward. And that means unless our solutions include some way of indemnifying them against some portion of the risk, unlikely to go to scale quickly. Uh, the fifth, again, one I've not mentioned so far, is in order to get things to scale effectively, we need to allow or even encourage monopoly monopsonies of something being licensed to, to do something. That is, in our experience, often inevitable to try to get the efficiency into the supply chain that will allow scaling to happen, but it almost always presents a challenge later. So at some point, there needs to be a strategy. I call it having your eye on the exit ramp. So you've got a plan for how to extricate yourself or broaden yourself from the monopoly that you yourself earlier in the process. Six, the projects and the innovators we saw, for the most part saw themselves as policy takers, but the most effective ones were also policy influencers, and they really were actively involved in trying to use their research or their projects to influence and affect the policy environment because that's such a scaling multiplier. And finally, as I've before, it's not a straight line. It's never a straight line. And it's important for donors as well as implementers to really understand how to build some greater level of adaptive management into the things that they do. That turns out much more easily said than done, particularly on the donor side. But I think there's a growing recognition of the importance of doing it. Finally, just a couple of things that I would address to you directly and to your colleagues in the CG system. I think it's unrealistic and perhaps even unproductive to expect researchers, people whose heart is really in the research side of this, to take responsibility for the entirety of the scaling problem. But I don't think it's unrealistic to broaden the concept of research to an additional range of things that affect the obstacles to scale and the factors that are involved in scale. Those things need research just like 
Just like the, the agronomic and the, and the veterinary things need research, and they ought to be part and parcel of what we're doing in our research protocols. Secondly, even though we tend to put things together as packages, it turns out when they scale, the packages often come apart or people bundle them in different ways. So the more our research calls either call for or allow for a greater level of bundling and unbundling of the components of our interventions, I could give examples if you, uh, the more likely they are to be successful in this, along the scaling dynamic. Third, we tend in our programs to think about attribution. Uh, and attribution tends to mean direct beneficiaries, direct, direct, directly serve people. But scaling invariably needs to look at things like, like indirect beneficiaries and sustained adoption and things that go on beyond and outside our direct engagement. So trying to find better research methodologies for making a, what I would call a plausible association between work and those larger metrics is important without looking like we're being self-serving. It's not that we're taking credit for those things, it's that we're trying to make it clear to interested how the work we did at least influenced or had some role in producing that. Fourth is a the baton passes between controlled and uncontrolled or between research and application settings in our observation are not nearly as good as they should be. Neither is is the engagement with or commercial platform rapid as it should be. And finally, I've made once before, but that I feel very strongly about. I think that the, the CG centers and the donors themselves could do much more to help strengthen these intermediation functions. And the future of scaling very much depends on someone doing that. For those of you interested, point away to just two things. First is this source book and where it can be downloaded if you don't already have it. And the second is for those of you interested in staying involved with this, the community of practice Ian alluded to at the beginning is quite active. It does have a working group on, on agriculture and rural development currently chaired by someone from CIMIT. Uh, and if any of you are in becoming part of that, send me an email, I'll be glad to make sure that happens. Thanks for uh, that was great, uh, and, a, and a great introduction to our to our workshop. Let me throw it open to questions and comments. Uh, let me begin here in Nairobi. Take one or two questions from Nairobi, and then I'll check if there's any comments or questions online. Who would like to kick off? Jimmy, introduce yourself. It's Jimmy Smith. I rather I really enjoyed your presentation. That's very good. Um, <clears throat> My question is about targeting. What does your source book say about targeting? The thing we're trying to scale is usually quite specific and therefore addresses the need of a specific typology of farmer, for example. Mm -hmm. When on the landscape, we have a very heterogeneous set of farmers. Yes. So we're likely introducing our product to the farmers who can scale it, but also many of them who can't scale it. So the shotgun approach, how do we get around that problem and be more targeted? Do you say anything in your source book about targeting? Not much to be perfectly honest, but I'll, but I'll say just a little bit about it now, if I could. The, the specification of target audience, I think is that people are very, imprecise about it. It's what I was calling the, de the denominator before. And that very first graphic that I uh, with the little orange bars on the left and the big white to the right, before you can even draw that, you have to say, well, what's the total audience that we're aspiring to on this? And some intervention really specify it. And if you say that audience is a very large audience, but you know in your heart of hearts that 70% of that audience is not going to adopt the technology, it can't adopt the technology that you're purveying on this thing. You'd be much better off to draw the thing smaller in the first place and say that we're really reaching 50% of the addressable market for this technology. 
And if somebody says, yes, but we want you to work on a different technology that works for, that would address a number of people, we'll take that as a separate question. If you just in mixing the two, if you basically say, well, the audience is that large group, our technology, you know, in our heart of hearts is not really designed for that large group, you're going to keep finding yourself with the little orange bars on the left-hand side, which is a very small place to be. The, the thing that I, that I think is uh, unfortunate now is that people are being pushed because I, I feel badly about this, but it's telling conversation that's pushed to claim very large numbers as their goals, very large numbers, but often it's a false claim. I mean, there's no chance that the things that they're doing and currently are going to reach those kinds of numbers of people. It'd be better, I think, to have a frank discussion about what we're working on and how many people it has plausible reach to uh, and have that conversation earlier rather than why we're not reaching the large you think we're supposed to. Yeah. Um, hi, Larry. This is Vishnin. I'm based here in Nairobi as well. Um, I co-lead the Animal and Human Health Program. Uh, working on the biosciences side. So one of the things that struck me in terms of some of the definitions or descriptions that you were using was when, when we've been thinking now about developing animal health products and specifically vaccines, for example, uh, we're being encouraged to differentiate between the terms proof of principle and proof of concept. Um, and proof of principle is basically showing that the design that you have made works, but it doesn't necessarily take you to proof of concept. Proof of concept is taking that proof of principle beyond that stage to show that it is at a stage where you can now get, say, a private sector company or somebody else to be interested in taking it into further large-scale piloting. And I'm wondering whether the similar kind of logic could be used in some of the things you were describing. I saw that your first tier was proof of concept and wondered whether if that, that should be proof of principle rather than proof of concept. And proof of concept then gets to the stage where your pilots don't fail. Yeah. Because one of the things, Ian, you were saying was that pilots are failing. And I'm wondering it's because there's the distinction between the two. And, and for example, in what we've been writing more recently and the discussions we've been having with private sector, they're making a very clear distinction between those two. And unfortunately, those two terms still get used synonymously. Well, it's true, and I think I'm guilty of that myself. The, uh, let me uh, speak to one piece of that. That's the distinction between proof of principle and proof of concept is not one that I've, I've been using. I'm going to think about that during our conversation now. But uh, but I will say one thing that I think is directly relevant to that. There's a discussion that happens in, in, a, in a lot of development space about uh, potential versus, versus, I'm sorry, about capacity or potential versus performance. And, and for me, it's, a, it's not quite the same, but it's, it's similar to what you're, you're alluding to. Let me see if I can draw this out for you. So you might he got the capacity to run a six minute mile. And I would say, well, has he ever run one? And you would say, well, you know, he's got the following lung capacity and he's got his calf and his body weight mass is, is such and such. And, and the, and so he's got everything he needs to run the six minute mile. I, Feel much better about this if I'd seen him run a six minute mile. So for me, the analogy on that is the narrative between capacity or potential or scalability and actual scale and or performance on this. So for what you were calling proof of concept, the closer it gets ladder, the happier I would be. And it was not just showing it could work, but that it does work. And and so every time I, I was uh, early in my career, I, I have a little bit of uh, hesitation in saying this in some quarters, but early in my career, as one of the people who developed in the log frame. And the, and the, and, and the log frame had a, 
very clear notion of constituted evidence. And predictive evidence was very different from descriptive evidence. And so to me, on the issue of scale, uh, I'm not very persuaded by a proof of, of concept that still remains a kind of a in the potential arena. Uh, and so if proof of concept goes all the way to we've shown that there are, for example, seed companies bidding for it, or that there are large swaths of, of territory where people are doing it, that to me is great. Then I would say that a level that's materially different than proof of concept, so proof, proof of principle. But if it more like we did a pilot here and we did an extended pilot there, then I would say it's calling second stage pilots and is not yet what I'm calling this other category of evidence. Okay, can I check if there's anyone online who wants to come in? Um, Addis Ababa, Ni speaking? Yes, Ni, please go ahead. Okay, um, thanks very much, Larry, for the very um, elucidating uh, presentation. So, a, a few things were running through my mind as you spoke. By the way, I've read uh, the Scale Up uh, book. Right. Work in the Impact Scale Program in Ilri. So, one of the things that I'm um, struggling to resolve uh, borders on some of the issues you've raised. Those uh, intervening factors you mentioned that can project to scale. There is a factor, there is a cost element, there is a donor. So I, I think there's need, as you rightly observed, that um, be a, a good systematic understanding across the landscape for donors, for implementing institutions, even for the CG system, um, to be able to handle this business of scaling. Uh, we find ourselves in a situation where donors are telling us, we've had enough research, any more research, just go on and bring these technologies. But in order to be able to do that second phase, of piloting that you mentioned. Some element of research is involved because what well, works in one situation may not necessarily work in another situation. So how do we reconcile all this um, uh, seeming confronting issues when handling the subject of uh, scaling? My second question is one of tools, tools to assess scalability of our technology. Um, uh, you did mention that there are now tools. How widely applicable are these tools, um, especially for people like me who are interested in scaling and for yeah. others as well? Thank you. Okay, well, let's speak a little bit uh, to each of those. Each Questions. I think the I'll begin at a kind of an abstract level. Try to get practical really quickly. I think my mother used to say, "You can't ask someone to be a foot tall." It's it's not realistic to ask people or institutions to do things that they weren't designed to do. I don't think that research institutions are the best institutions for scaling technologies. I don't, and I think if they put too much pressure on you to do that. You'll be unhappy and they'll be unhappy. Uh, what I think is appropriate and useful is for you to take a significant step in that direction because I think a bad point of contact between the people responsible for scaling or the people who are responsible for delivery at scale and the people who are doing research. And I think if each of you would take a step toward the middle, it would work a lot better. For me, 
that translates to in practice is trying to understand as much as you can what's going to be involved in getting the technology to scale. And I say that involves a lot of experimentation along the way, not just before you roll out, throughout the process. I think there's a research dimension. Some of it's social science research, some of it's agricultural and veterinary research, but there's a lot of ongoing research throughout the process. But trying to figure out where you as an institution relate to that, I think is a case by case, but it's dependent on a very solid crosswalk between yourselves and the people who are responsible for the actual delivery itself. If there's no intermediary making the marriage between the two, it basically means you and the deliverer need to be in close communication because you're, there's no marriage broker. You have to simply engage with each other directly in that, in a way that is to take the research and shape it, but even more importantly, the rollout of the research and continue, and continue during the, the scaling process to keep an active research and learning dimension as part of that. And I think all of those are areas where the system and you guys in particular could a tremendous service to the process of application, but you need to see it not as trying to get people to adopt your innovation, but as trying to help them improve their practice using your innovations. And that means being willing to let go of components and make compromise with elements and trade off things, all the things that are a little bit uncomfortable if you're coming at it from a more narrowly research perspective. Let me switch now to the issue of tools. So the, the tool that I know best is we were hired for about, uh, I think about three years by USAID's Bureau of Security to first do scaling assessments of five cases. We looked at at irrigated rice in Senegal, at hybrid maize in Zambia, at chickens in Uganda, at pix bags in Kenya, and at two wheel tractors in Bangladesh. To look at how they had scaled or not, and to understand the scaling dynamic as much as possible. Those five cases and a kind of a summary on them are written up think quite thoroughly. Then we were asked kind of on the basis of that to take a, a what we call the scalability assessment checklist that we'd use of other sectors and adapt it for use in the agricultural sector. And so we did that and it was applied I, maybe a half a dozen by, by now maybe 10 or 12 to different technologies. It's not simple. It's not hard, but it's not that simple. I wanted it to be easier, but enough things got added in a little bit, so a little bit complicated. Uh, the cases I know were generate some genuine inf uh, insights, but the ones I know best, the applications I know have involved someone from our team who was sort of coaching the people who are doing the who are applying the tool. I think it doesn't need that. And if, if you decide to use it, I'd be very interested in your feedback as to how user friendly it is and whether there are other things that, that might be done. There are much tools out there that are much simpler, but I think they're less, they go less deep. Leonard, who you'll be talking to later, uh, helped to develop one of those. I assume you should ask him about it. It's got 10 dimensions that are involved in scaling and it's quite straightforward to apply Sure, it does not need any extra help. Then there was one that I think Mark and his colleagues were involved. In. I think scaling readiness. I know less about about that one, but when you talk to the two of them, you should ask them to uh, to give you some details on them. As for the one that I know best, that which is the most complicated, but also the if you end up wanting to do anything more with that, let me know and I'll hook you up with people who know more about it. Than Thanks, Nee. Um, anyone else online wants to come in? And this is Helen. Helen, yes, please go ahead. Harry, 
My name's Helen Altschul. I work on the CGIAR research program on livestock. And I was interested in what you said about making allowance for bundling and unbundling of packages. Because in our, in our project, in our program currently, we're trying to, <laughs> to do some work in a few countries to show um, the impact of, you know, putting different technologies together in order to support livestock farmers. So, you know, putting over the siloing of research and showing, you know, feed intervention together with genetics intervention together with, you know, other technical interventions can work in a particular livestock value chain. So I'm just interested in, you know, in hearing a little bit more your thoughts on, on how we can go about this, because we have a conflict. We want what we're doing to be available and to be able to show impact, but we also um, need to be able to get some results that we can report about how this works in different communities and yeah. countries we're working in. Well, I, for better or for worse, I have a, a strongly held view about this. I think that for those who are on the development provider side, uh, we tend to think in packages because we put together a complex of, of factors that together produce an outcome, and that's the way we approach things. But when things go to scale, there's simply no way to enforce that cohesion. And people will pick and choose as they now, maybe the logic of the package will be strong enough that people will take it intact and apply it the way you hope they will. But I've seen many more cases where that's not what they do, where they find some piece or the other and they, they either hive it off that way anyway or it doesn't. Uh, and they sometimes do it in ways you would never have predicted. There's one case that has been reported to me, I don't know this personally, and it could be apocryphal, and one of you may know the true story about this, but I'll tell you as it was told to me, because even if it's not exactly true, I think it makes a point. It has to do with the rollout of the, the heat tolerant maize. And apparently in at least setting, after the research had proven the viability of tried to roll it out, what farmers said was, look, we had, droughts one year in six. The one year in six, when we have a drought, this seed would really save our crop. However, five years in six, we don't have droughts. And in those five years, it's an unnecessary insurance policy. And we're poor and we can't afford unnecessary insurance, so no thank you, we'll take There's a five in six chance that we won't have any trouble this year. So it didn't scale. Someone said, okay, maybe we can the same seed disease tolerance, same seed disease tolerance. And it turned out that that basically saved you somewhere between three years out of six. That was enough, according to the person who told me the story, to persuade the farmers. But they ran into a different problem. The problem of trying to get the seed to the farmers because it was basically made, seed is not a high value crop and it's heavy. And we were talking about last mile kinds of farmers. And they only solved that when they packaged it or when it got bundled together with veterinary, particularly vaccines, because those were high value, low volume. People were going to many of the same places and it didn't hurt to necessarily take a long commodity when they were, when they were going. And only at that point did the curve begin to go vertical. Maybe that's correct, maybe it's not, but the point being only that it took a lot of tinkering before you found a formula that worked. And I, at the same way, I think that's what happens at the household level, at the farmer level, that they basically may be giving them a whole package, but you have to be prepared for the fact that they're going to, they're likely to pick and choose. And you probably won't even know how they're going to pick and choose so you watch and see what they do. So I think I, I'm, arguing for trying to be more sort of less, have, having less of a catechism about what the end result is going to look like and more willingness when we have things we'll to continue following the chain for a while as we support the scale up and recognize that they involve something we think is less what we originally had in mind. I'll give you 
one more example. This is a, a slightly, I'll, I'll tell you the short version of what could be a story, but the extremely effective neonatal survival set of interventions uh, that cut child mortality or neonatal mortality by 50% in India. We're helping it scale to national. But the only way to scale it was to draw two of the central components of this for different reasons. This was not a decision that was made by the household. This, these were different constraints we ran into about trying to scale the intervention. So we took what had been very well proven, had been written up seven times in Lancet in uh, randomized control trials, and with the, with the agreement of the developers, stripped out two of its essential components with at least some, if not as much evidence, that it would work pretty well without those two components. And in fact, they got about 60% of the response, and it's now being delivered by 740,000 rural health workers in India. But if you'd asked the people who developed the, the package, they would have originally been horrified at the prospect of pulling out those two components. Okay. Uh, yeah, sorry, who's that? Oh, okay. Thanks. Thanks, Helen. Right. Let me ask if there's anyone else online before I come back here to uh, Nairobi. Anyone else online want to intervene? No. Okay. Let me come back to the room here. Oh, sorry. Michael. Yes. So, uh, hi, I'm Michael Gerber. I'm the Chief Operating Officer here at Aylery. Um, It sounds like a little bit of what you're talking about just now was this concept that they use um, in, in kind of tech startups, like lean startups, where you constantly try to get products out to, to the customers as soon as possible without making them the perfect, perfect product so that you can actually test it, see what the reaction is, take it back, Kind of re rethink about it and and then get it back out to the beneficiaries in our case again. It, it is and it isn't, my. The, I mean, in some things it is that. It, in some kinds of technologies, I think it is very close to the lean startup thing. But I, but there are certain cases where it's really not that. Where it uh, all, but it that it shares with the lean concept notion is the, the need to recognize the probable the probability of of modification along the way. And, and two things modify, one, the, the scaling strategy, and the second is the intervention itself. Both of those things end up being modified in the process of, of implementation. A lot of things, in my opinion, don't lend themselves to the sort of minimum viable prototype and, and rolling out. They, they just don't, they aren't that kind of. So some really do need exactly the kind of basic research, fundamental pilot project first. It's just that even when you're at that stage and you think you've got something that works, the need for a continued program of engagement as you roll it out and a willingness to modify, I think is a characteristic that it shares with the lean startup stuff. Okay, any final comments or questions before we wrap up this, this session? Ian? Yes. It's Niyi again. <laughs> okay. <laughs> this is probably an, an adult question that I'm posing to Larry um, because it's probably not been done before and probably for different technologies it would differ. Um, in terms of quantification, if you were to quantify, different components of a scaling process, the technology itself, the enabling environment, the private sector, and uh, the delivery system. What work would you put on these different components? And I said, I know it's probably an absorption. Just something to also get us thinking around the kind of emphasis we need to place on these things when we are attempting to scale. 
Yeah. It, well, it, it's it, you, the premise of you, namely the, the it's likely to be variable is right. But I'll at risk of being provocative. I'll say I would put about 10% uh, on the technology. The and, and the reason I say that is that if you look at the, the products that have scale almost without exception, there was something better out there. They had the formula for trying to move the thing through the system. When you know when when Cargill or or Syngenta decide to move something to scale, it may be the best thing. But even if it weren't, they have so many things that are right for it. There's so many things they've judged correctly about the environment and the activity for doing this that their chances of success go up by an order of magnitude. I think I wouldn't draw the distinction in your case, though, entirely between the product and the strategy for reaching scale. Because I think, I said earlier, I think the research continues into the strategy stuff, not just the product. And there are a ton of research issues. And too often they're done without the evidence you ought to have to move forward. So if I had if, if I could wave a magic wand, I would extend the the, the hand holding between the institutions and the implementers for a much longer period than often it continues. So you're kind of their evidence buddies as this thing begins to move out. And then it becomes more difficult to answer your question concretely because the evidence is a kind of an ongoing function. But if it, what we mean is the initial technology, I'd say 10% as a, as a rule of thumb. Okay, on that note, <laughs> uh, let's draw this to uh, a close. So Larry, thanks very much for getting our workshop off to a great start, as I, as I knew you would. Um, I, I think you've, you've, you've uh, provided us with a great, lots to think about a great platform to move forward in the next the next couple of days in, 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 in particular, but also given us a lot of things to think about as we as we evolve as a as, a, as an institute as a as a as a center. And um, I hope we can continue to you know, engage with you. This workshop is a sort of start of a of a process uh, that we would like to continue. So I hope we can continue to engage with you in the coming coming months and, 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 and years as part of, you know, moving Hillary forward to be much more effective in terms of achieving the impact that we, we want to achieve. Well, I would like that very much. And I would say in return, uh, myself as somebody just trying to push this idea of a scale perspective in this community of practice that I met before and agriculture working group are very much committed to doing anything we can to support this kind of thing. It's a very, uh, the community of practice is very loosely formed in the sense that it does whatever it wants to do with whomever wants to do it. But I know that there are at least a number of us who are very committed to advance this. And if there's anything we can do to help you, we're glad to do that.